Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Lazadra Museum virtually. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm the educator here at the museum. Um, and today we are fortunate to have uh, Miss Sue Bao here to discuss her um, book and her life changing journey. So she um, and her colleague, Lynn Marte Martinelli, traveled 54,000 miles to capture the power and beauty of the world's oldest rock and mineral sites. This uh, presentation is off will offer breathtaking images of ancient stone and re reveals a startling connection between our amazing planet and us. So thank you so much for joining us, Sue, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, one of the reasons that uh, my colleague and I wanted to document some of the world's oldest rock and mineral sites was based on something that was happening in my own life. And I grew up in a rural area in northeastern Illinois, um, northwestern Illinois, Crystal Lake. I don't know if anyone knows that area, but it's about 45 miles northwest of Chicago. And when we grew up, we had a rich environment, a rural environment that as children, we could go and enjoy and learn a lot from nature. And as rural uh, development um, started happening, the urban spread started happening, a lot of that life disappeared. So we had in my childhood about maybe 42 different birds that we could identify. By the time I left Crystal Lake, it had gone down to about 20. I go out there now and it's about 10. So a lot of the life has disappeared. That gave me a sense of wanting to go to remote areas in the world that resembled what earth was like before humans arose and simply experience it. So with that in mind, we started our ancient rock and mineral journeys. All right, so I'm going to turn off the video here and share screen, and we'll get into the show. Now, we called it Echoes of Earth, finding ourselves in the origins of the planet, because it ended up that's pretty much what we did. We didn't intend to discover ourselves. We intended only to photograph and document ancient stone. We found far more than we had ever imagined. Okay, so here we go. Now, when we published the book, we didn't have any pictures of ourselves in it. And a friend of mine said, uh, what are you in witness protection? Uh, why don't you have any pictures of yourselves in there? Well, as you can see, we did take pictures of ourselves, but they don't show our faces. So when we did a photo show in Vevey, Switzerland, we took a picture to show people what Lynn and I looked like. Uh, unfortunately, Lynn, my rock buddy and my travel partner died last year of ALS. So I, we were very fortunate that we were able to do these travels to go to the places we went, Australia, Greenland, Northwest Territories, before she was struck down with the disease. And it was a great source of comfort to her to know that she had those memories and those stories within her. Now, this is the, uh, what we know most about Earth is recorded in the stones. So we have this uh, sense of cratons. These are the orange stones that you see here underlying every continent except South uh, Antarctica. These are ancient shields from some of the earliest crust of Earth and they really shouldn't still be here. They're more dense and they're more, um, uh, they should have sunk back into the mantle. And for some reason, the geologists can't quite understand, they haven't. So in certain areas, like in, on the Canadian Shield, in the Barberton Mountains, and in some areas in Australia, they're still on the surface and you can go there and see this ancient stone. In the Canadian Shield, it's 4 billion years old. Now, Mount Narier and the Jack Hills are the oldest minerals. Now, what we did was go to these places uh, and get a list from the geologists. What are the oldest places in the world? They gave us this list. Mount Narier, Jack Hills, the oldest minerals. The Castor River, oldest stone. Achillea Island and Issua, second oldest stone. 
Black Tail Canyon, one of the oldest stone sites in the United States. Now there's an older one up in Minnesota, but the Black Tail Canyon one, you can actually go see, you have to whitewater raft in order to do it. So the first stop was in Mount Narrier, uh, which is Western Australia. It's about, I would say a nine hour drive from Perth, straight up into the outback. This was uh, an amazing uh, place to be. Where we went, we tried, if we could, to ask permission of the first people who were on the lands. And in Australia, it's the Aboriginals. Now their drawings were considered abstract art until it was discovered they were maps of the land. So here we have a central meeting place. We have a water source leading to another meeting place. We have an emu. We have honeypot ants. We have snakes, iguana, two iguanas here. We have frogs. We have kangaroo. We have all the uh, prey animals that Aborigines used for eating. So if you don't have a written language and you don't have a way to convey information except orally, then what do you do? You draw maps. So these are maps of the territory in the land. And we were amazed to see um, how much information they could convey. Now, this is an aerial photograph of Mount Narrier in Western Australia. It is one of the oldest sites in the world. Originally, this mountain was about the height of the Himalayas. And because it's over 4 billion years old, it has been worn down to a very small, it's about 1,100 feet high. So we camped uh, around the north part of it in a little mesa right about here. Uh, the photograph was taken from the air. Um, the McTaggarts who own the land have a plane because they own 500,000 acres. So the only way they can survey their land is by plane. Uh, a friend of ours, a photographer, had an IMAX camera and he took this photo of the entire mountain. Here's a little camper car that we lived in for three weeks. It had uh, two beds, an upstairs bed and a downstairs bed. It had a little kitchenette. It had a stove. It did not have a bathroom. So I found a book, How to Shit in the Woods. <laughs> this book was immensely helpful. Um, it definitely was helpful in terms of understanding how to uh, go with the wind, not against the wind, uh, up, you know, up incline, down incline to avoid um, pissing on your shoes. Uh, this was a very helpful book. I highly recommend it if you're going into areas where you have no bathroom facilities and your car or your camper doesn't have one either. The McTaggarts at the time, it was a sheep and cattle ranch and they were on what's called a muster or a roundup so they could not take us to the mountain. Now this mountain is a geologic mecca for geologists. Two weeks before we arrived there, NASA had been out there doing research on the rocky planets because the surface of this area here is very similar to what is found on Mars. So they were taking samples and doing research uh, right before we came. So they drew us what's called a mud map of how to get out to the mountain. Here's Mount Narrier. And Sandy would gave us the directions. Now he would say things like, you see this gate here? And we say, yeah. And you see this road here? We'd say, yeah. He said, well, that's not for you. So you don't go here. I said, fine. So the phrase, it's not for you, became one of our watchwords during their trip to Australia. This is Carol McTaggart. Uh, Sandy had built her a villa, an Italian villa in Western Australia. The climate is arid, very much like the American Southwest. So it's mountain desert country. If we went there in winter, because in the summer, it's brutal. So we started out on our own. They said, now don't get lost because we can't look for you for four days. So we said, we will not get lost. We started out, it's an eight lane graded highway. We thought, this is great. We're gonna have no problem finding this mountain. And then the, the road narrowed a bit, okay? Went from eight lanes to four, but still wide. Then it went to a road track. Now we could still see this, lots of uh, easy to see the track here, and then try to find the trail. 
it's not this and it's not this. We drove back and forth for two hours. And finally, I just said, stop the car. I got out and coincidentally, the sun had reached just the right angle to reflect off the grass. And I saw the bent grass right here, right along this fence line. And that was our road. We ended up when the mud map said rough bits, they meant it. We were driving on dry creek beds. We were leaving the seat. It was so rough, even though we were seat belted in, uh, we were bouncing like corks uh, on water over this rough, rough terrain. And I knew we were likely to get lost. So every 50 feet, I tied a black plastic strip to a bush or a tree. And on our way back, that was the only way we found our way out those markers on the trail. Okay, we got to Mount Narier. It looks like a little dragon, the back of a dragon. It's a very uh, rounded, uh, kind of soft looking mountain. Um, and then in the morning, we got to the base of it. So it's very red stone. A lot of this, uh, the land, it looks very much like the Southwest in terms of the terrain and the color of the terrain because of the iron ore in it. It's, uh, Western Australia is just loaded with iron ore. So you'll see this red orange to deeply red color, especially when the sun hits it at a right angle. Now these are eucalyptus trees. There are 32 different varieties of eucalyptus. A lot of the eucalyptus in the United States comes from Australia. And while we were there in the early morning, I kept hearing what sounded like traffic. It sounded exactly like I live close to the uh, highway. And I thought, that's really miles. It was the wind in the acacia trees making that sound. And I suddenly realized this was the voice of this place. And I stopped comparing it to places I'd been and I started to really see what was here. And that's a real shift for people who live in cities. When they go into remote territory, you have to get the city out of you. Otherwise, you'll go there and you won't have the experience the place can offer. So we had to learn how to listen. We found out there was this wonderful magpie called a Piper magpie, and it has a call like a glass flute. It's absolutely gorgeous and it will call in the morning and in the evening. We also learned that the poisonous snakes hibernate in winter, and we were there in the Australian winter, so we were very fortunate. We didn't have to deal with that either. So we climbed up the mountain to take a look at the top, and here's a photograph I took from the top of the mountain. This is our little camper car down here. And this is the outback. It's like an ocean. Now we didn't because we were so excited about leaving. Again, city folk here. We forgot to take enough food and water with us because in the back of our minds, we thought we'd find a 7-Eleven out here somewhere. I swear to God, this is what we thought. There would be a 7-Eleven. No, if you, there's a little settlement here. And if you miss this little settlement, it's 2,000 miles to the next town. To the south, it's 600 miles. To the north, it's about 400. And to the west, it's about 150. So unless you have uh, cell phones didn't work out here, computers don't work out here. Now imagine the isolation. So we had a shortwave radio that we could use if we got in trouble, but only if it was life-threatening. Because if we used it for a non-life-threatening problem, and the flying doctors had to come out, it was a $10,000 fine. So we had to be very sure we knew where we were, we knew how much fuel we had, we knew what direction we were in, and pay close attention to the environment. Uh, we soon uh, disabused ourselves that there was a 7-Eleven out here. So this is the top of Mount Narier. You go 360 degrees, you will see this beautiful view of the outback. And this is the extension of the mountain, one of the ridges of the mountain. It's in three layers. And it's so quiet there. 
The only human sounds were our footsteps. There were no mechanical sounds at all. Once we shut off the engine, it was all nature. So at night, during the day, if we stopped and we were, we were parked any place, we were sitting any place, the silence was profound. And this is something that's very hard to come by these days, especially in the cities. So then we started taking more intimate pictures of the stones and it really tells the story of this mountain. There's an igneous stone, some of the early uh, volcanic activity in Australia, but there hasn't been volcanic activity for which means the soil is fairly poor. The only way it gets nutrients is if there are fires. So the aboriginals used to set periodic fires, control burns to put more nutrients into the soil. There's uh, quartz here, shock quartz, some of them from meteor impacts, and there's just general quartzite formation, and then sandstone, and a lot of uh, laying down of river, rivers, sedimentary stone, metamorphic stone. So you could really see the history of the mountain in the stones around it. This is uh, some of the crystals, quartz crystal that was in the ground. It was all over the place. It looked very mundane. You could walk over it. There was nothing particularly um, standing out about it, except at night. And I'll show you what it looked like in a, in a moment. There was a lot of leaching of chemicals from the stones into the soil, which made these beautiful abstract patterns. And so we took some photographs of those. The reason this mountain is so famous among geologists is because of the zircons, these tiny grains of crystal that were found at the site. And they were dated with very sophisticated technology to 4.4 to 3.2 billion years old. This was a shock to the geologists. They had not believed that anything had survived from this early in Earth's history. They did it again, and they got the same results. Now, zircons are very tiny. There's a little zircon here. This is a human hair, and this is a penny. So it just shows you the proportions of the zircons. This is from the Jack Hills, which is about 35 miles northwest of Mount Narier. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get these zircons. They take tons of rock from these sites, crush it up, at the University, Curtin University or the University of Western Australia, filter through to get these zircons. And then they have to uh, shoot them with a laser beam and, and destroy part of them, unfortunately, to get the spectrum uh, of the crystal. Now these crystals grow, what they do, they're like little time capsules. They'll encapsulate the conditions on earth in their layers. So if there's any moisture, uh, the air uh, content of the air, it will get trapped in the crystal layers. And what they found out was astounding. This is what we thought Earth's history was like. 500 million years from the beginning to the first 500 million years were like this molten hell. Uh, the bombardments by meteorites, uh, this lava, uh, burning lava flow, until the zircons revealed their knowledge. And this is the story they told. That very early within the first 100 million years, there was solid crust, there was moisture, some kind of water, and there was an atmosphere, very toxic to us at this point, but an atmosphere. This completely rewrote the history of Earth. And they're still discovering information from the zircons even today. We spent the last night at Mount Narier, and it was like nature put on a show for us. The sunset, this was the actual color of the rock. It, it turned absolutely blood red. It was even darker than this. My camera couldn't handle the true color. Uh, I had to keep the, the guys who were developing the film from photoshopping it to make it. I said, no, this is exactly the way it looked. Our last night, uh, we did manage to bring enough juices and water and crackers so that our water, juices, and crackers ended at the same time our last night was there. So we managed to make it through 
uh, with our supplies. But at night, it was a full moon. I looked out of the camper and I about fell over. The ground was white. I thought it was snow, but it was moonlight. And in the ground, these lackluster quartz were glowing as if they had light in them. It was unbelievable. I was dazzled by it. Just brilliant. They looked like constellations that had fallen to the ground. And overhead, the sky was a mass of stars, right down to the horizon line. And finally, an aboriginal saying I'd heard made sense. They said, if you change something up here, you change it down here. If you change something down here, you change it up here. I saw the mirror of these two places. Constellations above, it looked like constellations below and in between the human being. And that's where they place human beings in Aboriginal culture as a link between heaven and earth. And I thought, now I understand it. It was a beautiful way to end our time at Mount Naryer, magical. I've never forgot it. The next site we went to was Achelia Island in Greenland, tiny little island off of Northwest Greenland. Now, some of you might know that Greenland started out near the South Pole. This is way back in Earth's history. And through the movement of tectonic plates, it drifted northward across the equator. It used to have a tropical environment and it's loaded with oil and gas and probably gold, diamonds, and a lot of other rare minerals. And then it drifted to its current position and was covered now with a sheet of ice that in some places is two miles thick. It's gained notoriety because of climate change and the melting of this layer. Uh, if, this le if this could melt uh, instantly uh, all at once, it would raise the sea level 12 feet around the world. So this is a huge lock of fresh water. Now the Aboriginal people here are the Inuit. The Inuit run from Siberia all the way across Canada into Greenland. And they have a culture that's about 13 to 14,000 years old. In Greenland, it's younger. It's maybe about 1,000 to 1,300 years old because it was colonized last. But the Inuit there, uh, they use stones as messengers messages, to write their messages. They're called Inuksuit. And here you have a pointer stone, and here you have one, two, three, four, five stones, and a pointer stone at the top. So it means one, two, three, four days travel in this direction is the meeting place. And they use this all over the Arctic because there's very little else to use in order to, to be able to get, convey a message. Now, the person who told us about Greenland, this was Steve Mojus from the University of Colorado. He's one of the experts, uh, geology experts on Greenland. He said, you have to stay at the sailor's home. Uh, now, Greenland is a Danish uh, territory. It's now got home rule, but it's still uh, like a protectorate of Denmark, the way Puerto Rico is to the United States. So he said, this will be, uh, it's good food and it's very cheap. And we followed his recommendation. What he didn't tell us was there's 500 men in this place, dock workers, sailors, and only about five of us women. So we were quite the attraction uh, in the place and uh, had a great time. The guys were very respectful, but they were also Nuke is quite an amazing, it's the capital of Greenland, and it's quite an amazing place. It is uh, still, I believe, the world's biggest supplier of CDs. Now, I don't know why, but this became quite an industry. When Denmark gave Greenland to the United States during World War II to prevent the Germans from the Nazis from getting it, um, the Inuit and the native Denmark people fell in love with American country Western music. They, they just went crazy for it. So they started making CDs. Now, Greenland is also the place where all the failed rock and roll bands from Europe go to make CDs. So we had Romanian bands, we had Lithuanian, we had 
and we play in our cafe. cafe there. Also, food in the Arctic is hideously expensive. Uh, an apple was five dollars, a banana was ten, uh, so we ate once a day. We'd eat probably, we'd have a little bit in the morning, we'd eat at noon, or we would eat at night, and that would be about it. That's all we could afford. The houses are also color-coded. Anything red is administrative, green or gold is healthcare, and purple is like government buildings, um, and then there's different colors they have for residential. They just approved turquoise when we were there. So the turquoise houses they could have. It's 24 hours daylight in the summertime. So there is nonstop activity. Now these houses here, these are called projects. Anyone who's ever seen Cabrini Green in Chicago would know what that is. This is where they move the Inuit from the villages into Nuke. And I asked uh, Bjarni, who was the ex-mayor of Nuke, how did they survive? as far as the culture is concerned. They've been taken from a rural subsistence culture, very much connected to nature and put in these high rise buildings. He told me, and I found this to be true pretty much around the world with traditional people. He said, if the women stay strong, the culture survives because the women carry the culture. And I thought that is amazing. So I want to talk to the women. Uh, we got a chance to talk to a couple of them. Uh, if you ever want to find out what's really going on in a country, talk to the women. They will tell you, especially the native, traditional, or aboriginal women. They really know. So we had a chance to talk to a few of them. Unfortunately, our time there, um, it was cloudy and foggy, and it didn't look like it was going to change. So when we talked to Bjarni, who had been, who was in Inuit Danish extraction. He said, I was raised in the old ways and the spirits find your project interesting, documenting the old stone on Achelia. So don't worry about the weather, it will clear. And as we were talking in the hotel, the sky started to clear and the fog rolled back and we got this beautiful sunset. This is at 12 midnight. The sun just brushed the horizon and it is a very strange feeling to see the sun travel in a circle overhead, not rising in the east and setting in the west. So we got used to 24 hours of daylight, which was wonderful. My husband kept telling me, you know, you'll need a flashlight. I said, a norm, there's no night. <laughs> I said, you'll be able to see these, these Fabulous stars. I said, Norm, there's no night. <laughs> so from about mid May to about mid August, nobody sees the stars. They can see the moon when the moon is visible at night. They can't see the stars. There's no night. So the next day was spectacularly clear. We had to hire a little boat to go out to the island. So we hired it from Sven. Uh, who was Inuit Danish and really, really nice guy. He took us out there and here's Nuke. And we had to travel all the way through these islands, this little network of islands down to Achelia, down here. It's very small. It's about a half a mile wide at the most. And we noticed that his boat didn't have any life preservers. It was a very tranquil, very uh, calm sea. And we, we asked him about it. We said, why don't you have any life preservers? And he said, well, because if something happens and the boat sinks, the water is so cold that you'll die before anyone could see you and rescue you. So what's the point? So we were crossing our fingers that nothing happened to his boat. On the way back, the water was really rough. So we were praying very hard uh, that the boat stayed in one piece and it did. But that was uh, the reality um, in this Arctic area hardly anyone has a, has a life preserver, what's the point? This is Achelia. Now this is an island right behind Achelia with these beautiful little mountainous formations. Achelia itself is pretty flat. This is the area the geologists have cleared off to study the ancient stone. Now Achelia is in the Arctic area, so it's pretty exposed to some of the storms and some of the other um, difficulties that uh, the weather can present. 
but it also has absolutely spectacular examples of metamorphic rock. Now this stone was actually formed vertically and has these, this layer cake um, uh, series here of lighter and darker stone. And then it was pushed over on its side and it has this beautiful strike. You can see the absolutely clear blue sky that we had. It's perfect photography conditions. This is part of the stone that was a metamorphic stone that was created when this island was malformed during all of the tectonic plate activity. The lighter parts here, the orange and green, that's a uh, lichen and also seaweed that attaches to the stone. And this stone was absolutely gorgeous. We just kept taking photograph after photograph of this beautiful area. This here, the same thing. Now there's a lot of horns blend, feldspar, uh, epidot. There's green stone here. There's um, uh, olivine in this, mica, beautiful stone. And it looks like it's still moving. It's very powerful, very powerful. Other, uh, this island was like Tolkien's um, Lord of the Rings. It, it had such a magical feel to it. When we first got dropped off, we had no, there's no beach there. So we had to crawl over these boulders to get to the actual island itself. We learned later that it's an Inuit custom. When you come to an island, you crawl on your hands and knees to show the spirits that you are friendly and they show them respect. So we had inadvertently showed respect to this place by simply being able to, you know, having to crawl on our hands and knees uh, over this uh, stone. And there were spirits on that island. I would hear footsteps behind me thinking it was Lynn. I would say, Lynn, look at this. And I'd turn around and then I'd notice that Lynn was way across the, uh, the island. So it was a really interesting experience um, to feel that. Now this is, a, this is what's called a dike. This is uh, horn blend and felt, feldspar and mica in there. It's just it glitters like there's um, this beautiful uh, sparkly um, snow almost on this stone. It's just dramatic. This was almost like, you know how you throw a stone into water and you get this ripple effect. This was like having water in stone, having carved this from erosion. Uh, this island is really beat up by these Arctic storms. This you can see some of the chemicals leaching out of the stone and again forming these beautiful colors. We really wanted to, we stayed there all day. We, we would have loved to have stayed overnight, but it's a protected place and we would have had to apply to the government for permission to stay overnight. Here's some of the life that was in there. Um, these beautiful, uh, this is a succulent. It looks exactly like a cactus. These look like little marigolds uh, or little chrysanthemums. They're only about an inch high. And this is a puffball lichen, very tough life on this island. It has to endure uh, hurricane force winds. Temperatures that at times will go 40 below zero. And then in the summertime, the temperature lately can get up into the 90s. So the temperature range for these little life forms uh, is up to 200 degrees and they can they flourish under it. It's, they're, it's very impressive the way life has adapted to these places. Filled with rainwater from the storms, fresh water everywhere on the island and beautifully preserved in these little pools. This is the actual ancient stone, 3.8 billion year old stone. It looks very unprepossessing, looks very ordinary, but this is the actual ancient stone. It looked to us like animals kind of resting in a field. Uh, and this is where they take the samples from here and uh, take it back to the lab and analyze it. Uh, Steve Moja said he, this was his favorite place. Again, a place you can just commune with um, as well as uh, explore geologically. Then other areas of the, of the island were completely different. This area looked like someone had gone through and sculpted um, the stone, sandstone area, uh, probably even almost like um, whetstone, almost like um, soapstone. 
And the sculptures from the wind and rain were astonishing. So we took a few photographs of those before we had to leave. And uh, so we spent about eight to 10 hours on the island. Uh, it was very cold with the wind, but every time we took shelter behind this, the stone, the mosquitoes would get us. So lots and lots of mosquitoes in that area. Now this is the peninsula of Nuke, and this is the formation behind the peninsula. It's again, very dramatic, especially in when the light is clear and you've got a good day. When I took the plane back out of Greenland, we went along the west side of Greenland, and we saw these little fishing villages here. Now, everything happens in the summer because this is when they gather their food for the winter. So there's a frantic activity to harvest fish, to harvest seal, to harvest whales, uh, so they can lay up food for the winter time because there are no grocery stores here. There's no farms here. Uh, the, the weather and the land is just too harsh. So it's all from the sea, 90% from the sea. And then others uh, like wild blueberries, uh, other wild berries, other wild plants. It's a very subsistence way of life for a lot of people, uh, but also one that's disappearing. Um, in some ways that's unfortunate because there's a knowledge of the land you get that you don't get any other way. And development is coming to Greenland. There's already gas and oil uh, contracts out. Um, so we were in Greenland in a very fortunate time to see it at a pristine state. This is the last photograph I took in Greenland. You can see the glaciers coming down here and uh, melting into the fjords. Each one of these dots is an iceberg about the size of a house. And the rate of melt, even in 2002, was incredible. It has since accelerated dramatically. Uh, even in 2002, when we were there, they were seeing areas of land that hadn't seen the light of day for 12,000 years. So we came home and we said, the Arctic is melting. Now talk about going from ice to fire. Uh, our next stop the same year was Gr Blacktail Canyon in Grand Canyon in June, July. And it was 110 degrees. Okay, on Greenland, 65 was a warm day. Okay? So the only way to get to Grand Canyon is whitewater rafting. That's the only place where you can get to Blacktail Canyon. It's at the bottom of the Grand Canyon along the Colorado River. Luckily, my brother had uh, signed up for an adventure um, to, with a company that would take us through the Grand Canyon. It would just happen to fall in the same year. So I signed up to go with them. Now the Havasupe tribe are the caretakers of this particular section of the canyon. They have built this plexiglass bridge walkway out over the canyon and the tourist money helps them support their clinic and their education. This is clear plexiglass. Now, when you step on this, what you see is 3,000 feet straight down. You will never get me <laughs> on this walkway, ever. <laughs> I have uh, a total uh, fear of heights and I'm a total wimp when it comes to something like this. So these hardy souls are out there on the walkway looking down, I wouldn't touch it. But this is the way the Havasupe, and this was finished um, right before we came. So they have uh, tapped into crazy white people coming and wanting to walk out over the Grand Canyon. Okay, now the Blacktail Canyon is a slot canyon, which means it comes from the side into the Colorado River. Um, the cautionary tale with that is thunderstorms up on the plateau will cause flash floods in this slot canyon. Uh, you have to watch this extremely carefully. If you are in a slot canyon and a flash flood comes, you will die. There is nowhere to go. There's no place to climb. There's no way to get out of the way of a flash flood. And every year, um, they have to watch this extremely carefully. There are people die who don't pay attention to this. So luckily, we had pretty good weather. Now this is whitewater rafting. Here's myself. Here's my husband. Lynn couldn't come with me on this trip. So this was the only trip we made where she wasn't with me. And going into the Grand Canyon, uh, ordinarily rapids are zero to five in terms of, um, of danger or level. The Grand Canyon, it's zero to 10. 
So because the river is so deep, all the rapids are navigable. So you get into a level 10 category rapid and you are going to go through some pretty hair raising experiences. Now, luckily the rapids are short. So like maybe a minute of screaming terror and then three hours of floating. So it's very exciting. I was terrified. Uh, and then it's absolutely gorgeous. So you see the entire geologic history written in the stone. This is absolutely fabulous. You rarely get a chance to see this. So you have the igneous stone here, and then you get the levels of metamorphic and sedimentary stone above it. Now, some have, because of earthquakes, have been rearranged. So in some places, younger stone is, on, is beneath older stone. But in this section of the canyon, it was pretty much like a layer cake of geologic age and just stunning. And you can see that ordinarily, when the river is churned up, it's red, but when it's not, it's emerald green. It's absolutely beautiful. So Blacktail Canyon, the Slot Canyon, you can see here's my nephew down here in the lower left here. And this goes on for another 30 feet. So very tall, narrow Slot Canyon. You can see here, the scoring of the flash floods and the winds and uh, the dust particles the winds carry. This, this land has been pretty thoroughly beaten up by the elements. I love this picture because the people look like they're part of the stone. They just kind of blend in with the stone and the movement of the lines gives it this sort of sweep and this sense of motion and uh, dynamic energy. The Vishnu schist which is the oldest stone. It's 1.7 billion years old. It's igneous stone. And it is the bottom layer of the continent. So the entire continent rests on top of this. Now in most places, it's buried beneath two or three miles of other types of stone and then topsoil. But here in the canyon, you can actually walk into it and see it and touch it and feel it. We were lucky. The week before, this canyon was buried in 12 feet of water. It was bone dry when we got there. And what was interesting is the power of this stone to affect people. Uh, I was traveling with 26 um, people who were like camp counselors. So there was a lot of noise wherever we went. And when they entered this chamber, every one of them fell silent. It just had this cathedral sort of mystical um, feel to it as if they could feel the age of this place. I wanted to stay here for a week, but we had to move on. So I took whatever pictures I could. This is where the stone cracked and the quartz, uh, lighter quartz and other elements filled in. And then they had, uh, it looked like, um, almost like an animal, ancient prehistoric animal uh, in this chamber. Uh, but I love the dramatic lines of this. Uh, so I took a picture of this stone. It also has what's called the Great Unconformity, where there's one billion years of Earth history is missing. One billion years. So they have the 1.7 rock layer, billion year old rock layer, and then right above it is one 700 million years old. So a billion years got evaporated, got eroded away. So whatever life forms arose, lived, and died during that time are gone. And it kind of made us think about history and the stories that survive and how our knowledge is put together only by the stories that survive. So the stories that don't survive, it's missing information. It's like in a family when an entire generation is wiped out, all that knowledge is gone unless it's preserved. And here it was not preserved. So the record of that life doesn't exist. That was a powerful experience. Uh, and that set us up for the next experience, which was Northwest Territories in Canada. Again, we did this in summer, which meant 24 hours of daylight. So a Castor River is way up in the Northwest Territories the capital of the Northwest Territories. And this is 150 miles almost directly north. The knife is, and in the midst of the tundra. 
Now, the tundra is an amazing place. Um, but again, the Dine or the Inuit, the Inixit uh, stones here were the original people. So we asked permission from the chief negotiator for the Aboriginal people, Tim Malone, for permission to go onto their land because this is their backyard. And he said, certainly you can. Um, so we took, uh, we took a, a float plane up there. But Yellowknife, Canada is really an interesting place. It's full of granite boulders. So when they built the hotel where we stayed, they built it into a granite boulder. I never slept better anywhere in my life than we slept in that place. And they also told us, you have to see the city dump in Yellowknife. Now, Yellowknife is also unique because it's a blend of Inuit and white culture. So when they tell you there are 7,000, the population of Yellowknife is 7,000, they're counting 2,000 ravens in that internet, in that uh, count. Uh, 2,000 ravens, they consider them as part of the population. And that's uh, in honor of the Inuit uh, Inuit culture, which considers the raven a sacred bird and a messenger bird. So we wondered, all right, we'll go to the dump. We don't understand, but we'll go. And then we found out the dump is the Costco, the Sam's Club, the Walmart, the grocery store, the hardware store of the entire area. Anybody who has extra paint puts it out here. Now, this only happens in the summertime because in the winter, with temperatures going 40 below zero to 60 below zero, at that temperature, metal shatters. It's like glass. So you can't really put the stuff out in winter and expect it to be uh, able to stay. So everything has to happen in summertime. They put it out here, you need paint, you'll get paint, you can exchange it. You need tires, you come to the city dump. Here's the tires. Again, in the winter time, these are frozen solid. You won't be able to use them. So we tried to wait until the weather would clear so we'd have good weather and it never cleared. So we'd, the last two days we said, we have to go. We have to go to this place. So we rented a float plane from Air Tindy. Air Tindy is still there, I checked. They still fly people up there. It's about the size of a Volkswagen. My poor partner was in the back. I was sitting next to the pilot. We had about six inches between us uh, and we took off. Now we had a little bit of blue sky that quickly disappeared. The tundra is like an ocean, like the outback. The difference is you don't know whether it's more land or more water when you see it. So traveling during the summertime is very difficult if you don't have a plane. During the winter, all this is frozen. So it's easy to travel over it by snowmobile, um, by little snow tracks, so snow trains, uh, even by dog sled. But during the summertime, it's actually more difficult. Plus these lakes are full of mosquitoes. So when they hatch and they hatch around late June, there is a blizzard of billions and billions of black flies and mosquitoes, which makes travel in this area also pretty difficult. Now we were flying up to a little island. It doesn't have a name, but it's well known among geologists. So they call it Acasta Island. They call it the Acasta Nice, uh, the ancient rock that's here. And you have to know the coordinates in order to find this little island. My poor partner was throwing up in the back of the plane and I asked if she could get a photograph because she had the, the right window. And she heroically took this photo of the island here. This is a little patch that the geologists have cleared off in order to study the stone. So we landed in this little bay here. Thank God we landed because I was about ready to throw up as well. It's a very rough flight. Uh, when the tundra warms up, it creates thermals and then there's a layer of clouds. And when you fly between the tundra and the clouds, it's like a, a roller coaster ride. I would not recommend it. We got there, the weather was not great. Um, 
we had only four hours. So we took all the photographs we could at just a frantic pace. But the really powerful part about this stone is that it's seen the entire rise and evolution of life on Earth, crust of Earth. And again, people are amazed it's still here. The conditions that were there for its formation no longer exist. So this stone is unique on Earth. And it has an incredible beauty um, to it that we did not expect. Now, because there was a mist and a light rain, it really brought out the color of the stone. This is green stone. This is really, really green stone here. And you can see these scratches from glaciers. It's glacial action. So in a way, when the glaciers covered this area, they actually helped protect the stone from weathering. And then they, about 12,000 years ago, the glaciers receded from this area as this whole region Earth started to warm. So you see these beautiful greenstone examples here. Uh, and just the, the way that the stone is formed and the convolutions, it makes it look almost like it's still in motion. Uh, it was a, just a dramatic shoot. The different types of stone, you can see the subtle colors in here reflecting some of the minerals that are in these stones. This, like a waterfall, this quartzite in here, uh, the greenstone and the quartz, is like a waterfall of quartzite in there. Again, something that we hadn't expected. And then subtle, little, almost like grace notes, little uh, beautiful abstract art, the way the stone fractured and created these almost puzzle-like formations. Uh, this one is one of my favorites because you can see the lines that connected it, then the fracture line but the design continues from one part of the stone into the other. And the same thing here, you've got a little dike, tiny dike here. This was uh, hematite in some of this, and this is a uh, hornblende feldspar. So these two stones, probably the glacier pushed these two stones together. You can see the grinding action here that, that ground up these stones uh, into smaller pieces, uh, beautiful formations. Then we saw the lichen. Now they call this map lichen because it is like maps from another world. And the ancient stone and ancient life have really worked together to create the environment we have today. This lichen will dissolve the mineral into particles of soil that will then be used by other life forms to form uh, like topsoil. This takes a long, long time, especially up in this area because the growing season is so short. So gradually this entire boulder will be dissolved by the lichen. And the lichen is the, one of the toughest life forms on earth. Here you can see it in different stages. Um, they can survive. Here's some of the fruiting um, uh, seed, seeds where they have the spores coming through in the lichen, but they can survive uh, temperatures 200 degrees below zero, they just go into hibernation and then they pop up again, and 100 degrees above zero. So this is probably one of the life forms that uh, could survive interstellar travel. Maybe they arrived here on meteorites, uh, but they're incredibly tough. This is a whole wall of a cast of nice. Now this is not a protected place. Had Lynn and I stayed here for another two weeks, we, for $5, could have had the, owned the lease on this island. Um, Japanese came. They took a container full of stone away. The government does not protect it. So anyone who wants to come and haul away uh, the Acasta Nice is free to do so. There's no one to stop them. Uh, only Achillea Island was protected. Now, in Australia, the McTaggarts have actually gotten National Heritage Protection for Mount Narier. But they've also, the government has built an astronomical array to the southwest, and Mount Narier is now part of the quiet zone, so it's now a protected area. It can't be mined, it can't be blown up for exploration. So, but this area here is not protected. Now, we were wondering, how does this relate to us? This is wonderful to know all this history, but how does this relate to us? And when I came back, I discovered that some of the earliest minerals on Earth are in our bones. 
So hydroxyapatite, apatite is one of the earliest minerals formed, is actually in the long bones in our bodies. And it forms the basis for the calcium. Now you can see the complex structure here, just like in minerals and stones, you have a complex lattice structure. You have the same thing in your bones and human bone is amazing. You have these mineral layers that make it compressible. So it's flexibility as well as strength and it's self healing. So this is an amazing uptake of these ancient minerals in our skeletal system. It's the foundation of Earth's surface and of the human skeleton. This is the Haversian canals that are in your long bones, in the hard bones in the body, and it looks like a windswept landscape. Uh, again, we found over and over that nature finds a pattern for something and will use it again and again in different contexts. So here you have the holes where the uh, bone cells are made, and these holes here are for nerves and blood vessels. So you have a living matrix in your bones. And this is something that is uh, very rare to have a biological uptake of a mineral that actually is part of a living system. Usually the minerals stay as minerals. They don't really get uh, engaged biologically, but they do in calcium dehydroxyapatite. Does. The appetite forms 95% of the minerals in your teeth the enamel in your teeth. One thing we had not expected, we definitely set out to photograph ancient stone. We'd not expected to find ancient life. And this is what we discovered by accident in Northwest Territories in Canada, in the, or in the Great, Great Slave Lake area. Now we asked people, why do they call it Great Slave Lake? And nobody knew. So then we decided we'd ask the native people, the, the Inuit, because they probably did know, and of course they did. They said, oh, well, in the old days, all the Inuit followed the caribou. They have a 1500 mile migration north and then south, and all the Inuit would follow the caribou, except for the people around the lake. And they decided the lake would supply them with fish, with food, with um, plants, everything they needed, so they wouldn't follow the caribou. So the other Inuit started calling them slaves of the lake. And then the English came along and misunderstood the name and called it Great Slave Lake. And that's how it came about. Nothing to do with slavery, nothing to do with African Americans. Now, the weather was really bad uh, when we were back in Yellowknife. So we couldn't get to this little island here in Great Slave Lake where they had fossil stromatolites. And the stromatolites, which is Greek for stony carpet, are the oldest life form re remnants on Earth. They tell quite a dramatic story of life on Earth. So this captain, uh, ship's captain, Captain Smith, had taken a slab of the fossil stromatolites from the island and put it in his backyard. And we asked him if we could come and photograph it. And he said, sure. Come. So we got a close up of the, and this was even, I got even better close-ups. But this is the fossil, these are mineralized. Uh, what used to be a living system is now completely mineralized. But they show you the formation of the stromatolites built by bacteria. And for the first three quarters of Earth's history of life on Earth, it was ruled by bacteria. The first 3.5 billion years, bacteria and viruses were the only life forms on Earth, and they were astonishing. One of them was the ancient cyanobacteria who had figured out how to use oxygen as fuel. So they invented photosynthesis. Brilliant. I am so impressed by bacteria that I'm such a fan after doing this research. So the ancient cyanobacteria, which they extracted from some of the fossils, and the modern cyanobacteria have the same structure. This has been so successful that the structure has not changed in 4 billion years. And they were the greatest terraformers on Earth. They built these colonies around every continent. And they created these stromatolites by secreting what amounts to the first concrete. They build a layer made out of silt and a little mucus uh, that they ex excreted. And then they would get covered over by water. They push through 
Photosynthesis again, build another layer, get covered by water, push through and over and over and over. It's only the outer layer here that has the living cyanobacteria. Everything else is concrete. It's so hard. They have to use explosives and uh, diamond saws to cut through it. If they wanted to get rid of the stromatolites, they would have to use pretty serious explosives to get rid of it. Here you can see the little cyanobacteria that's in the outer layer, and there's a whole series of them. The reason they're the greatest terraformers on Earth is one simple thing. They made oxygen. They made it by the billions of molecules. And as it penetrated into the oceans and saturated the oceans, um, they formed banded, iron banded formations, which is still in existence in most of the oceans of the world. And the excess, when the oceans became saturated, they went into the, the molecules of oxygen and the atmosphere. It took about 2 billion years. It's called the Great Oxygenation. And you know, there's some other um, explanations for it. Uh, that still remains the most um, well-known theory. And they changed the face of the earth. They put in an ozone layer, which made life able to live on land. Otherwise, it would be sterilized by the ultraviolet rays of the sun. So I got my macro lenses, and I got up close to the slab, and I just started taking close-up after close-up after close-up. I wanted to see the structure of this, and every layer was built by these tiny bacteria. This is 1.7 billion years old, this particular fossil. And you can see it's what's called the domed or egg carton pattern. Um, others are massive um, arches and look like almost wheels. This one, each of these layers, they look like wood, like a wood grain. And the final one that I got was even more dramatic. Uh, the white part are minerals, probably quartzite. And these are the structures that were preserved um, by the fact that they were made practically of concrete. So you can see how incredible it is that these were built by tiny bacteria and they covered every continent in the world. The only living remnants in very few places in the world, and that was one of them was in Shark Bay, Australia, which we also got to. And again, the aboriginals are the caretakers of that land. Uh, there weren't any to ask permission. Um, so we asked permission of the person who owned the area where we went, uh, Hamlin Pool, which is where David Attenborough went, Mr. Kopke's land, to photograph life on Earth, the stromatolites there. So these are movie star stromatolites. And this is a very pristine, undisturbed beach here that we, he allowed us to uh, camp overnight. And we said, can we pay you? And he said, just send me a book You know, when you get the book done. It took 10 years, but I sent him a copy of the book, and he had a copy before he uh, sold the land and left it. So this is a stretch and it goes on for 10 miles in each direction. Tourists don't come here. So unlike the Shark Bay area, which is tourist um, heavy, uh, we were the only ones on these beaches. We were lucky we had a new moon and we had a very low tide in the morning. So we could photograph the stromatolites uh, pretty far out into the area, uh, into the bay. They're incredibly diverse. It's almost like the bacteria, in addition to being great builders, have an artistic sense. So they would build different structures, almost like different artistic periods um, of these uh, little sections. Remember, only they, looks, they look dead, but they're not. The, only the top layer is alive. Everything else is just uh, concrete. And here, it looks almost like abstract art. Uh, Lynn was reminded they looked almost like uh, furniture made by a Danish artist. Uh, and she really found them intriguing. Then there were what we call the muffins. Uh, there was other um, stromatolites there, very much alive. And the footprint here. Now, you'll notice the tide is starting to come in. We didn't notice this. We were so busy photographing, we didn't notice the water was starting to creep up around us. We noticed there was a little 
um, almost like uh, jellyfish in there. And I found out later, book of fossils, this is 23 million years old. These little cre creatures have been around that long. And little minnows in here, they live in salt water that's 10 times saltier than the Indian Ocean. This keeps predators down. So they have pretty much an uninterrupted and undisturbed environment. There's very little that hunts these or that eats these. Um, so the water is very salty. It was cold, so we couldn't remember it's their winter. Uh, so we couldn't really go snorkeling. So we stuck a waterproof camera underneath and snapped and got a couple of really good pictures. Here you can see the reflection uh, on the surface of the water here of that stromatolite. Now the water and the tide is coming in fast. Uh, we took our last photograph of our last roll of film because we were using film and not digital. At the time we made the trip, the digital cameras were too expensive. And then was uh, isolated on a rock. She managed to get back in time. But after the last photograph was taken, the whole bay was underwater. We wouldn't have been able to photograph anything. So we were very lucky that we got what we did. Then like the ancient minerals, we discovered later that the ancient life is inside us in our mitochondria. And this was astounding. With the free living bacteria that was able to use oxygen as a fuel, got swallowed up by a larger cell. And the, the, the kind of the agreement was the little uh, mitochondria would produce energy for the cell. The cell would provide a safe place and then all the nutrients that the mitochondria wanted produced a eukaryotic cell, a complex cell. This was a huge innovation and allowed an explosion of complex life. Now, the more energy a tissue needs, the more mitochondria it will have. So the heart muscle, which is the most energy absorbing it has to work constantly. Organ in the body uh, has the most mitochondria. And this is a little green globes here. This is cardiac muscle cells, muscle. Um, it's, it's healthy cardiac muscle. And it shows the mitochondria here. So like the cyanobacteria, the key element was oxygen. In the mitochondria, the key element is energy. If your mitochondria die, you die. You have no way to produce energy. So this is a huge invention. So we carry, it's, a, it's amazing, the evolving story of life within our cells. And we carry the long history of Earth in our bones. And that's why we title this whole talk, Echoes of Earth. And that's the title of our book, Finding Ourselves in the origins of the planet. And we didn't know how appropriate that would be. Okay, I think that's the end. I, I think I should stop the share. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, I'll get my video back here and I uh, hope you're all still with us. <laughs> and any questions? Uh Thank you so much, Sue. Um, that was a, a great presentation. I did actually um, have a question from Chris, and yeah. I believe it was around the time um, that you were talking about the Grand Canyon. And uh, they asked, um, did you find that missing layer in other areas that you visited? That was, there are other places where there is a, an unconformity like that, but not in the areas we visited. In the areas we visited, it was pretty much uh, one solid um, geologic record, either the ancient stone or more recent stone. Um, now in Australia, um, because they've started mining for iron ore for the, for the Chinese, uh, huge mining expeditions, the Jack Hills area is gone. It was completely mined and destroyed. But one of the silver linings for the geologists was they got to see all the geologic layers uh, when they uh, excavated that area. And they got to see some of the more uh, ancient stone underneath 
the um, Jack Hill Slayers. But otherwise, uh, that's pretty unique in the Grand Canyon. They don't have a real complete explanation for why one billion years got eroded. Um, they just know that there's the record. Uh, the 1.7 billion year old stone and then right above it, the 700 million year old stone. So there's lots of theories about uh, what might have happened, the inland seas that um, flooded the place, might have carried away sediment. There might have been some ancient rivers that carried away sediment. Uh, maybe some of it had to do with tectonic plate activity. They're not really sure. They just know there it is, a billion years missing. Well, it's sort of like, um, if I may cut in a little bit, um, mm -hmm. it's just like here in Illinois, where we go basically from our bedrock uh, limestone, which is about 450 million years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next layer that we have is the, the glacial stuff. So the right. glacial topsoil, um, right. there's huge chunk, chunks of history missing here. Um, and really the only reason we know what we know is because the glaciers left signs that they were here, uh, but the glaciers that are were huge in ripping up and taking away a lot of the history of, mm -hmm. of Illinois, at least in the Chicago land area. So um, it's very it's not uncommon to have those kinds of um, unconformities or uh, non conformities. Um, really, sedimentation. There's you either have periods of extreme sedimentation mm -hmm. where things are building and building and building and then you can have area uh, times periods of extreme erosion where so much time goes missing and that is very very common in the geologic record especially when you're dealing with rocks that are billions of years old right. it is incredibly rare to have billions of years of rocks or right. rocks that are billions of years old preserved which is uniform. why your whole uh, yeah. talk is is pertinent Right. And it, what's really rare is how close to the surface they are in Canada. You have the Canadian shield there. It's right at the surface. And, and that's the glaciers. Amazing. That's yeah, all the amazing. glaciers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and in uh, Australia, Australia Mary, the land is really old. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Mary had a question she wanted to know. She said, thank you so very much. Uh, so much. Very exciting. What is your educational background? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's really varied. Um, I come from, um, how should I say this? The, the academic background is liberal arts, but with a passion for science. So I've ended up being a science and uh, medical editor. So I worked for, I've worked for several major publishers. We produced uh, earth science books, life science books. And I also worked for Encyclop Encyclopedia Britannica as a uh, medical writer. So I've been able to cross over the liberal arts, which is the artistic part, with the science part, and uh, been able to talk to and interview geologists and then uh, get a lot of self-education just because I'm fascinated by it, but also shared with uh, geologists who were so generous with their knowledge, their information, their papers, um, explaining some of the findings they had, uh, particularly the shrimp technology where they date the zircons, there's a, there's a fascinating lab up in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, one of the people who uh, dated the early, oldest uh, rock form, mineral forms um, is up there. And he's, uh, he says, anyone who wants to come up and, and you know, view their equipment, just give him a call and uh, you know, he'll make room. Of course, with COVID, you can't do that. So it's been a mix of liberal arts and science uh, education and also traditional uh, understanding traditional cultures. We were very fortunate that every place we went, we were able to talk to a traditional elders. And that was a revelation because I found there were like four layers to each place we went. The first layer is the tourist layer. And people come, they see something, and then they go home. Now you can have a profound experience as a tourist and, and a life-changing experience. Then there's the invader immigrant level. So Europeans or whoever comes in and they have, they take over the land basically. And they uh, develop it or they exploit it or they, uh, they use it. Then there's the original people who were there. 
uh, traditional people, aboriginals, Native Americans, uh, whatever you want to call them. And then there's the land itself. And each of those three groups has a profoundly different relationship to the land. So the aboriginal um, and traditional relationship I found was one of kinship, which is a very odd concept to us. We don't even have a word for it in English. And the concepts are difficult, where everything is your relative, as if it were a person. So when they say um, the relatives they have are two-legged, four-legged, winged, uh, creepy crawlies, they mean it. It's not like a romantic notion. It's not like a mystical notion. It's uh, a literal notion that they are part of a larger web and every life in that web has its own rights and its own uh, knowledge and wisdom. And humans are simply part of that. They are not the dominant species. And they learn and they uh, caretake and there's a stewardship involved. Uh, the European view is the land is there uh, to be used. Uh, to what we can get out of it, what we can build on it. Our relationship to the land is not kinship so much as ownership. And that's very different. And the tourist view is you come in and you observe all these amazing things and you may have a sense of wonder about it. So in a way you might have kind of a native experience. You might feel a kinship to a place and feel like you wanna come back again and see this, or you might have a longing to return to a place. You don't own it. Uh, you don't have any uh, property there, but you do have a relationship to it. So I found um, that that understanding, and then there's the, the uh, land itself, which has its own history, separate from us, completely separate from us, and its own ecology and its own um, evolutionary development. Uh, so having those three uh, worldviews in mind gave us a, a really unique way to look at these places, not only scientific, not only artistic, but a deeper level of what it is to be human in this world that contains so much other life and that we depend on it so completely for our existence. And that really changed us. You know, I come back and I, I see everything a different way. I don't consider that I own the house I have and the property. I consider we are stewards of it, caretaking. We're caretaking this land. We're taking care of it. We're making it um, so that it thrives and that it's uh, flourishing. And then we're gonna pass it on to another person. So we don't own it. Um, we have a relationship with it. And that's, that's quite remarkable. All right, I think we had another question. Um, he may have sent it to you as well, Sue. Um, he said, uh, you provided, uh, this is from James. He said, you provided amazing pictures of the cyanobacteria-based stromatolites. Did you view lichen-based stromatolites as well? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, mostly it was the um, cyanobacteria and other, I mean, it's a whole colonies of bacteria, it's not just uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, the cyanobacteria gets all the credit because it's um, featured in a lot of uh, photosynthesis and uh, a lot of um, uh, papers that, that talk about uh, the oxygen um, event. But lichen we did see in, especially in the Northwest Territories where there's life lives on a very thin margin there. Where we were is uh, taiga, not tundra. So nothing grows taller than maybe two or three feet. That's it. You won't see trees there. You'll see bushes. We saw black willow bushes uh, and mostly uh, small ground plants and lichen um, because the, the conditions are just too harsh. Uh, you get hurricane force winds up there of 100 miles an hour uh, and just incredibly brutal temperatures. And you, you, nothing can survive except what grows there. Uh, it's very tough. So when the uh, environment is disturbed by mining um, or by other kinds of excavation as they have around Yellowknife, it will take centuries for that land to recover because it's simply, the growing season is so short, it simply can't do it. 
So it's really disturbing to see the amount of destruction, um, especially diamond mining will do, which there's a huge strike around Yellowknife, um, almost equivalent to what's in South Africa. There's pink diamonds that are found nowhere else in the world, so everybody is there. And they have to take tons of, um, of earth to get the diamond, uh, what they call the diamond uh, tubes from the mantle. And they, they simply ravage the countryside. They just pulverize it. And then they leave and it's left there. Um, streams are blocked, whole areas are just devastated. Uh, and then they go. Every morning at nine o'clock in the morning, we would feel the ground shake three times. And it was their, the dynamiting for the, um, for the diamond mines. So yeah, it's, it's kind of disturbing to see that, um, knowing that that's, that devastation will stay there for a long, long time. Well, that was kind um, of a long answer to your question. Okay. Um, okay, so um, everybody, um, so there was a question about the book. Um, so I will um, answer this. We do have um, both uh, Sue's book and her timeline, which she can better explain, but um, we have right. both in the um, shop. So this is her book, Echoes of Earth, and then her timeline that she uh, produced herself um, available in the museum shop. Um, yeah. And I will turn it over yeah. to uh, Sue. You can describe your, your, your timeline okay. a little better than me. <laughs> yeah. What I tried to do was find a timeline that would summarize the rise and the, the partnership of ancient bacteria and ancient stone in the rise of life. And I couldn't find one. I looked everywhere because I thought, well, all I have to do is just permission it and put it in the book. So I had to, I had to create it. Uh, so I uh, put it in two ways. Here's the usual timeline that we're given. This is all complex life. And here's the first 4 billion years of life over here. And we don't really care about that because we weren't there, right? So why should we care? So I had to draw all of these because nobody had them. So this is a rise of life from about 800 million years to the present. But that tells a very, very short part of the story. So what I did was open it up and then from the beginning, give you a sense from the Big Bang all the way through to where we are now of all the important inventions by the bacteria to set the rules for life and create the environment that allows all of this complex life to exist, okay? So for four billion years, the ancient stone and the ancient life created the environment of earth that made this possible and they still maintain it. So this timeline puts it all into one succinct place where you can see the real story of Earth, uh, life rise and development of life on Earth. And then I did a booklet that goes with it that explains uh, some of the ge geologic, how, for instance, they set geologic eras and periods and eons. And then some of the other information in here of what each of the uh, panels uh, shows and describe what I tried to do is to was, uh, feature animals that had significant evolutionary developments like the notochord or the spinal cord or the backbone. So this is sort of like one compact uh, expression and succinct description of the timelines of Earth the way you usually see them and then giving the full story. Uh, and that was really a labor of love. Um, I had help from individual um, scientists, but nobody had the whole spread of it. So you will end up knowing more than most scientists <laughs> about the whole spread of the timelines of Earth. Um, and this is available too through the museum. So really support your wonderful museum. Uh, I'm giving this to uh, museum to sell at half price. So ordinarily the timelines are 20. Uh, I say, please get, sell them at 10. The book is ordinarily $40. I said, sell it at 20. I really want the book out there. Um, it has some unique design features 
that will uh, surprise you, I think, uh, that, that show off the stone and give you a feeling of you're right there at the place. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I wish I could have talked to you more and seen you more, maybe when COVID is over and we can be together again. Um, I could give the talk uh, again and we could, we could share it more intimately. But thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you so much for, for joining us and we will be uh, posting this on our uh, website. So if you wanna go back and, and learn a little bit more, refresh something in your uh, from the talk um, that will be available. And um, again, her books and her book and her timeline are available in the shop. We are taking appointments right now to come and visit the, the shop. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us. And I hope yeah. you had fun and you learned something. And yeah. also the book won some awards, so <laughs> which was a great shock. <laughs> and uh, uh, for art, uh, photography, environment, science, um, a host of things. So that was a real, um, that was a real pleasure to, to know all that hard work was recognized by my peers in the publishing industry. That was, that was quite an honor. All right, so, right, well, well, thank, thank you, you everyone much. and um, have a great holiday. And uh, right. next week we are doing our last Slow Art Saturday at 2 p.m. So if you'd like to join us for that, um, please do. We'll be right here on Zoom. <laughs> so thank you again and uh, happy holidays, everyone.